<laughs> okay, um, before we get rolling today, I want to check in with you now that we've had a couple of lectures under our belt about midterm and final. I've gotten a couple of queries about this in email. I thought it would be better to kind of save the response to that uh, for our lecture. So um, the, the best way to study, of course, for the midterm and the final or the things to really emphasize in this class are the lectures. The lectures are the place that I take a lot of the ideas from your readings, text readings, reserve readings, my own knowledge, you know, classes I took, and I synthesize those together and give those to you. So it's the richest amount of information that you could get in the class, and if you're taking really good notes uh, on the lectures and you have the ability, and primarily this is what the exams are about, to repeat back to me the major ideas that I talked to you about, then you do well on the exams. Um, the, the part of this class that's about synthesizing information, you know, compiling, creating new kind of thought, that's going to take place in the writing. So really think of yourself in these uh, in the exams, the midterm and the final, as summarizing big ideas uh, with all of the details that we talk about in class and writing essays on these in, in these exams. So the format, for instance, of both the midterm and the final will be very, very similar. The final may have a longer essay on it. I haven't determined that yet. Um, what will happen is an image will go up on the screen. <clears throat> these are images that right now are all in the PDF files on Canvas. The files that are on there that limit the number of images that you'll be studying for, right? That we talk about a lot of images in class, but then those PDF files just have a select number of those. That image goes up on the screen. The first thing that you'll do is identify the work that's up on the screen. So right now, you would say, Raphael, this is the School of Athens, 1505, 1510, somewhere around there. You have plus or minus 10 years on this. That is worth two total points. One point for the artist's name, a half a point each for the title of the work and the date of the work. And the emphasis there is, I figure, if you know the artist's name, you will probably be able to find this on Google if you wanted to find it, right? That's the world you live in. That's what's most emphasized. The title's pretty important because it'll tell you some things about the work of art. And then the date, lesser importance, again, half a point total in the entire exam, 2.5 points. Not a lot, but enough to maybe bump you from one grade to the next. And the idea there is just, I want you to have a general idea of where these exist in history. I don't want you to spend all your time worrying about the dates of these. I know how that works. I was once your age. Uh, you don't remember it for very long. But you will, if you put a little effort into remembering the dates, go, oh, this one came before that one, or these were both produced at the same time. Because that's the way I would study. If you're worrying about the dates, just go through and say, oh, this entire group of art could be, if I put down 15, 10, I would get you know 90% of them or whatever. Does that make sense? The vast majority of the points on the midterm come from an essay you then write. You're given about 10 to 12 minutes, and this image goes up. I say, identify the work, and then I basically say, tell me the most important things about this work, drawing from your lectures, your reserve readings, your texts, and any discussions that you've had in section. This is where things get a little frantic, and this is what separates the students in this class. Just about everyone will be able to say, hey, this is a high Renaissance work of art. It's about classical values. It's about ideals. There's something about Plato and Aristotle in there somewhere, God the divine craftsman, Neoplatonic theory. I know some things about the context. What will separate the people who get C's from those who get A's are the amount of specific details and explanation you put in those essays. So a for instance on this is, let's say this work goes up and you're always going to want to think of these three things, right? Number one, the context. What was going on at the time that had an influence on this work of art? Let's say you said, well, I know Coley keeps talking about the middle class. That's important. And you just put context, middle class, right? And you don't say anything about it. I'm not impressed. I'm like, what? OK, so what? What about the middle class? Why is that important? What did they bring to the table? How did that change the work of art or the, the style of the time, right? You want to explain yourself. So the rise of the middle class comes about. It changes the feudal system. These are people who achieved what they achieved on their own merits. They want works of art that are more 
naturalistic or refer to this world, that kind of stuff is what I want in there. Yeah? When we go on to, let's say, another part of the context, or you know, you can slip this into the style and say, what is the aesthetic philosophy? It's another really important thing that you're always going to want to answer in these summaries. What is the aesthetic philosophy? This one's super complex, right? This is Neoplatonic ideas, the mixing together of Plato and Aristotle with Christian theology. And a lot of you will struggle at this because you'll just think, oh, it's okay to just say, hey, there's something about Neoplatonism in there. It's Plato and Aristotle and Christianity, and that's why ideals matter. And I'll say, no, you didn't explain it. I don't understand how those go together. The rule of thumb should always be, I am trying to explain this to a fellow member of my class who missed that day, and I want to do Kolya's job for him. So when he spent 25 minutes trying to explain Plato and Aristotle and Christian theology and how they go together, I have to do that too in this essay. Now, you're not giving him that much time, so you're going to have to write these things out in advance and say, what is my easy way to summarize what Neoplatonic aesthetic philosophy is? and how it's linked to this idea of the rise of the middle class and humanism and so forth. Yeah? So then you go on to this. Now it's all about the visuals of the work of art. And you can talk about the style separately. You can talk about this as an integrated um, type of discussion of the content of the work of art. And you'll be saying things like, OK, well, I said that the ideals really matter. The aesthetic philosophy is such. Where are those ideals in this work, for instance? And you could, again, you could start this with talking about style. Here are the things we expect to find in the high Renaissance style, and you could go through and explain those, as we've done in this class. Or you could just integrate it into a discussion of ideals in general and discuss that, right? All of the little nitty-gritty specific details. A question has come up about, like, how much emphasis do I place upon reserve readings or readings and discussions versus the lecture? I'm not going to give you any firm percentages, but I feel like if you came to all of the lectures and you really, really paid attention and you weren't confused about anything and you took excellent notes and you repeated all of that back to me perfectly, you could get uh, a mid-range to high B. If you do the readings, which is totally obvious to professors, by the way, we all get it, right? You don't need to, in fact, don't say, hey, so-and-so, this author said this. It's a pure sign that that's the only thing you remember from that reading, frankly. What you want to do is integrate the ideas of the reading into the essay. And it's just clear. If someone's done the reading well, it shows up in their essays. And that Again, the reserve readings are key. We'll bump you up if you have all those ideas from the reserve readings showing up in these, these essays. Just the big ones, the ones that are important. Bumps you up, let's say, another 10%. Now you're up into the low A range. If you also have all the text and you're you know, engaging with these things, that's where, where you'll get the four point. In a class like this, there's no reason everyone in this class couldn't end up leaving here with a four point. You won't because it's spring quarter, frankly, and a lot of you are like getting your VLPA credits and you're going to be like, oh, I don't really need to do that reading probably. But absolutely, you have it in your, uh, every single one of you, your capability to do it. This is not brain science. This is right off the bat survey level art history. You're going to have a ton of information. You're going to have a couple of ideas that are pretty complex. You're going to have some struggles early on probably figuring out what a formal analysis is and what we're asking you to do. But if you come check in with us and you ask the questions that you need answers to and you try, there's no reason I couldn't just go through the entire list of this class and be like, excellent, four point, four point, four point. It would make my job a heck of a lot easier too, right? It's easier to grade very good papers than it is the ones that are kind of mushy in the middle. Does anyone have any questions on that? You will do some practicing of this near the midterm, right? You can always do practicing of this anytime you want. One of the ways that you can see, am I taking the notes that I'm supposed to be taking, is to just come by my office hours and say, this is what, and just write a little summary bullet point. Here's all the things I would be able to discuss if you put this work of art up uh, on a midterm or a final. And I'll say, that looks excellent, or you know what you're missing, or I want more details here, or whatever. You'll also be doing this in section, again, closer to the midterm, where you'll actually have a timed essay to get you comfortable with this. Because 10 to 12 minutes is not a lot of time. 
You can't be scratching your head thinking like, ah, oh, what did he say about that? You really have to come ready to just roll on these things. So, more logistics. The midterm, because this is a writing class, I'm not going to keep you here for the full hour and a half. Um, we are doing a ton, uh, and we'll be doing a ton of work behind the scenes, giving you feedback on all of your writing, and we just can't handle like a huge midterm, or frankly, even a final. And because you've got so much work in the writing end, what will happen is you'll have five questions on the midterm, five exactly the same time questions spaced out over the content areas that we've covered. I can't cover everything, of course. I'll have to pick representative examples of things. And again, five essays, each 10 to 12 minutes long. That's it. So identify, write the essay. About the same thing on the final, maybe a few, maybe one or two more essays on that. Does anyone have any questions at this stage? So I've got another one for you. My exams are never surprises. There's never any moment in time in which you'll say, oh my goodness, I can't believe he picked that work, right? Those works of art that you'll see over the course of the quarter that I spend maybe a minute on just to say, hey, here's another Raphael Madonna. And guess what? It looks almost exactly the same as the last one, except this time you've got a tree on the left instead of the right, right? And then we go on to another thing. That's not going to show up on the midterm. The ones that I'm just like blah, 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 over and over and over and over and over about, those are the ones you have to just put a big star next to in your notes and say, that could be it. Now here's the thing. I'm going to spend forever on this. It's not going to turn up on the midterm, a uh, little hint here, because it's one of the options for your summary essay assignment. However, um, uh, if, let's say, I talk about this work and ideas that I talked about on lesser works are applicable here, you're absolutely going to want to synthesize those ideas for the lesser works into your discussion of this bigger work. Does anyone have a question on that? So if I go over that, again, the Madonna figure, and I say some ideas that are absolutely applicable here, bring them into your discussion of this work. Does anyone have any other questions? I mean, you don't meet in section before your uh, compare and contrast essay is due. So does anyone have any questions on that? How's spring quarter going? You guys look kind of tired already. You doing OK? Yeah? OK. All right, so Raphael's School of Athens in the Stanza della Signatura in the Vatican. Very important room. This is a fresco painting. Remember what fresco buono is, and again, uh, one of the ways to study for all your exams is you have your lecture guides. When you look at your lecture guides, you have at the top, most often at the top, some big ideas that will be applicable to many, many different parts of the lecture. In this case, in lecture guide number one, you had things that were primarily associated with the context. Then you have artist names, titles of works, and dates. And then below that, you have a whole list of uh, names and terms and so forth. These are all, all things that show up in the lecture or show up in the reading, and you should absolutely be able to say, hey, who the heck's Verrocchio? Why is that important in this? And be able to know that stuff. When you're studying for an exam, if you look at this and, and you think, I don't know any of these ideas here, you're in trouble, right? You're going to want to go look those up, look over the Panopto lectures again, make sure that you know those things. So in this case, um, we're on the School of Athens, Stanza della Signatura, very good example of the high Renaissance style in Italy. I mean, it's almost as if this work was uh, created specifically for art historians to have this question on an exam, like, why is this an excellent example of the high Renaissance style in Italy? So let's start with the subject matter itself. So the subject matter, what we're actually seeing. The subject is a kind of synthesis of different figures through time, starting in Greek times, a couple of people from Roman times, and a couple of people beyond that. So Neoplatonists, in other words, later day uh, philosophers, all put in one space, uh, representing the subject of basically humanistic knowledges. They're not all just philosophers, most of them are, but there's people like Euclid in there, um, as well. So we've got some scientists uh, in there as well, mathematicians, geometrists, and so forth. 
And the idea is that this is a humanistic branch of how you get knowledge. And it's juxtaposed, as I said last time, straight across from it is the realm of religious knowledge. So he's trying to cover all of the bases. You've got religious knowledge, poetry, cardinal virtues under law, uh, and philosophy. So we've got, for instance, in the center, and remember, this is your focal point, so this is the place that you think this is the most important thing, Plato and Aristotle. And Plato points up to the realm of forms, and you should be able to explain why that's important, what that realm of forms or concepts is, because that's where all truth resides. And Aristotle, by the way, they didn't live contemporaneously, right? These people are all compiled into one space, but they didn't live at the same time, says, no, 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 it's down here in the earth. It subtends or exists beneath the appearance of all things, that order. That's where you find it. They're locked in a kind of endless debate about this. Those two thinkers together, along with, again, Christian theology, represent Neoplatonism. And Neoplatonic ideas have been around since, basically, you know, Christianity have been around. Uh, and so there's no kind of one set of ideas that are strictly speaking Neoplatonic. But for the purposes of this class, what I keep kind of emphasizing is that basic idea where you have God the divine craftsman, he made this world, he made us in his image, therefore there's something of his perfection in us, and an artist's job is to show you the perfect world, to show you perfection. That will bring you into contact with God. Right? They're mediators of God. Or another way to put this is to read you a quote. Right? This is from Leonardo. He says, quote, If you despise painting, which is the sole imitator of all visible works of nature, you certainly will be despising the subtle invention which brings philosophy and subtle speculation uh, bear on the nature of all forms. Sea, land, plants, animals, grasses, flowers, which are enveloped in shade and light. Truly, painting is a science, the true born child of nature. For painting is born of nature, to be more correct, we should call it the grandchild of nature, since all visible things are brought forth by nature, and these, her children, have given birth to painting. Therefore, we may justly speak of, the, uh, of it as the grandchild of nature and as related to God. All that like genealogy there, child, grandchild, that's all platonic ideas. That's basically Plato saying there's that realm of forms, that's the father, that's God for Neoplatonists, right? Father for Neoplatonists, and it's just again for Plato, the realm of forms, who begets us in his image and this world. There we've got the child. And now we've got painting that is finding in the child, in nature, the perfection of form, a la Aristotle, see it beneath the appearance of things, and making it available to us as the, quote, grandchild. I know it's complex, but that's how you decode these readings. They're all kind of analogs and so forth. So there they are in the center, and Plato holds under his arm the Timaeus, his major text, which you can read right on the, the binding. And Aristotle holds the Nicomachean Ethics, his major text, on the idea that order exists beneath the appearance of nature. They are the focal point because they are the vanishing point for a central one-point perspective. Follow all of these lines, the orthogonals, back, and they all stop there. They're also dead in the center. They are also framed in contrast against the light background. We've seen this before, right? This is Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper again. They're also successively framed by these archways that lead you into them. No one overlaps them. That's typical Renaissance organization. Very, very rational. Look here first. This is important. Then you look at these characters, and along the uh, orthogonals, you might see other important people. This is Michelangelo as Heraclitus in the foreground. This over here is Bramante as Euclid here, teaching geometry. This over here is actually Raphael, way off to the sideline, acting humble. When you look at this work again, you'll notice that it's very unified, everything tied together. So we look at Plato, he points up. Notice how all of these figures look at him, more implied lines pointing to them. You've got this kind of 
arm up next to these and then all in a row, ding, 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 and then an arm linking this, another arm here. If you've got any spaces here for emphasis to allow you to see the sculptures, look at what happens. Arm reaches out, arm reaches out, connecting these two, get here. Look at this line of the edge of the arm, points down to this end of the arm, through this kind of bald head that's exactly the same, through this highlight to this figure, and then you just work your way around the foreground. Everything's very structured, everything's very ordered, meant to move you around it systematically, meant to link all of the characters together. When something needs to be emphasized, Plotinus over here, notice how he's given his own space. That guy must be important, right? Yeah, he's one of the major Neoplatonic thinkers, so you're gonna emphasize him in there. The other big thing about this though, and the subject matter is remember, they are putting Renaissance artists' faces on these classical thinkers. This is very interesting because remember before this time period, before the Renaissance, artists were just craftspeople. They were very skilled laborers, but you didn't think of them as someone who had special access to God or were doing anything that could provide you with knowledge. But at this point, remember, artists are saying, no, 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 we're much more than that. We're the mediators for God. So when you put, for instance, Leonardo da Vinci's face on Plato, what are you saying? Well, one of the things you're saying is Leonardo's like a classical philosopher, right? He's a thinker. He's someone who has access to knowledge. And on the other hand, you're saying we are like them. We are the Renaissance. We are the rebirth of these classical thinkers. Right? I don't know how many of you did this. When I was a little kid and I had like a, a, a major, usually it was a sports figure I wanted to be like, I would like act like them, right? You put on clothes that were kind of like them and you'd act like them and everyone do something goofy like this. You still do it a little bit. I do it every once in a while. Barcelona, by the way, is playing Man U today, so I'm all up on Barcelona today. Anyway, too much knowledge, right? So here you go, right? You wear these things and you act like them. Yeah, and I was a little frankly, short white guy, and I liked Michael Jordan for a while. And I don't know if you saw this Michael Jordan where he's dunking. I, the hoop's like up here, but I remember doing this with my friends, like, we're going to dunk or whatever. That's what they're doing. They're saying, I'm like them. I want to be like them. You're claiming a sense of identity based upon the classical past. We are the rebirth of this. Then let's go on from that. What else is in this picture that's worth kind of paying attention to? Well, someone brought it up last time. Again, there's some terms you need to know. Hyperillusionistic painting, things that trick you into thinking what you're looking at is real, or in this case, as if you're looking through a window, that Renaissance window onto another more perfect world. We call that trompe l'oeil. It's a term on your lecture guide, trompe l'oeil, fool the eye. Hyperillusionistic painting. This kind of painting here, in which you paint in gray tone so as to mimic the look of sculpture, and in this case it's pretty trompe l'oeil as well, is specifically called grisaille. Gris in French is gray, so grisaille means gray tone painting, basically. It's meant to make you think you're looking at these sculptures. Now, the reason I give you these terms is I don't want you to, in the middle of an essay that you're writing for me, say, hey, this is all painted in gray tones, also known as grisaille. What I want you to do is just integrate the proper terminology into your essay and say, the grisaille painting of these figures here, da 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 da, I'm all know you know how to use that term. In this case, who is that? Who is that? Someone help me out. Who is this? That's Apollo. Okay, what do we know about Apollo in this class? We haven't learned anything about him, but in Greek mythology, what does Apollo represent? He's a god of the sun. He's a god of beauty. He's the most beautiful of the gods. He's a god of music and poetry, so the arts. And he's a very, very rational god. And remember, rationality is key. So all of the other gods usually get pissed off and do something crazy, or Zeus is always on the lookout for ladies, very sensual, very questionable in their rationality, but Apollo, for the most part, is pretty even keel. So he, re he represents art, rationality, and beauty here. On the other side, who is that? Athena. Athena, or Minerva, as she's known by the Romans. For those who get tripped up on this, Either term will work for me. We're in Italy, so they tend to use the name of the 
Italian gods. I tend to be snobbish about this and say, well, they are Greek gods first and use the Greek god names, but either one would work. If you don't already know this, the Romans basically adopted the entire pantheon of Greek gods and gave them new names, primarily names that we associate with planets. So here we've got Athena. What does she represent? Knowledge, Knowledge wisdom, right? Wisdom and wisdom in warfare. She is the strategian. And that's important here because the person who commissioned this work is Pope Julius II, who, again, fancied himself as the warrior pope. So we have strategy and war associated specifically with his patron, but also just wisdom in general, knowledge in general. And again, she's all about rationality. Nothing sensual about Athena. When Athena is born, and the way you can always tell us in Greek mythology is the way that those gods are born. Athena springs fully formed out of the head of Zeus. There's no sex involved in all, right? It's all just intellection. So here you've got two gods. Why do you think they represented them? Because what are we saying about the Renaissance style, about classical philosophy, about Neoplatonic aesthetic philosophy? We're saying it's about beauty giving you knowledge, right? Art giving you knowledge. And you've got these two gods that represent that. Keep looking at this, and a, a number of you will say, hey, I, I've got an idea here. Um, let's go through the stylistics of this. How are the, how, what else is ideal about this? Someone just shout one thing that's like, that's ideal. One thing. You're in the dark. No one will see you. You can say anything. I'll, I'll pretend it came from over there. Go ahead. Okay, proportion of the figures, right? We have ideal proportions to the figures, all canons and proportions. Start with that. Always going to be like that. Notice how the vast majority of them are exactly the same height, exactly the same build. Every once in a while you have a guy who's a little bit taller, but he just looks like the same proportionality. What else? We're all made in God's image, right? So you have to create that ideal form. What else is ideal? Again, tick your way through the formal elements. How about the composition here? What would you say about this composition? Is it balanced? Yes, it's balanced. Roughly symmetrical? Yes. Right? Easy to take. What is the compositional structure? Primarily horizontals and verticals. Aren't they very, very stable things? The way you observe the world, you're a vertical being against a horizontal ground plane. Very, very comfortable. Not a lot of diagonals in here. Then you've got this weird pyramidal form here, that open space in the middle. That's also stable. How about the color scheme? A lot of primary colors. Little dots of more intense colors, but roughly speaking, these are all analogous. Don't put a lot of complementary colors next to each other. Again, analogous colors tend to harmonize, don't they? This is also seen as ideal. Rational, yeah, it's all about the subject matter starts with rationality. Clear, yes, foreground, middle ground, background, certainly in here. Central point perspective, what am I harping on about central linear perspective about? Why is that important in this? It's not reality, it's better than reality. better than reality. It's perfect space. Perfect space. That grid that underlies all space that God put into the universe and on and on and on. You with me so far? So let's talk about a couple of other things in here. What's Michelangelo doing besides brooding as he was wanting to do? What's he doing here? He's this guy. Writing. Is he writing? He's drawing on that marble block. This is apparently how Michelangelo created sculpture. He would draw basically like figures on the block and then carve out the form. It's a famous quote that I'll give you in a, in a minute when we get to Michelangelo. He says, a single block of marble does not uh, potentially contains within it everything that you need, and all I do is clear away the extra stuff. So there it is. He's at work. He's set up right in the foreground, so he's given a prominent position. Right at the same time period this is being created, he's down the way working on the Sistine Chapel ceiling. And if you're looking at this and you're saying, it's kind of weird that this gets kind of asymmetrical with this dude. How many people think this guy's the odd guy out, by the way? It just looks kind of weird. Everything else looks very ordered, then you've got just this dude lounging on the stairs. Right? 
This is totally speculation, completely anecdotal. Most Renaissance historians would say, no, nah, that's not what's going on here. But for a while, people believed that what happened is that Raphael was, uh, of course, a competitor for, with Michelangelo when it came to these various commissions. And Michelangelo got stuck with a crummy job, right? The Sistine Chapel was a crummy job. He didn't want to do it. He's over there you know, on his back kind of griping, bitching, and moaning about he wants to go back to do sculpture and so forth. And Raphael's got the cush job here in the Stanza della Signatura. Michelangelo was notorious for keeping his uh, Sistine Chapel very secret, didn't want anyone to see it. But supposedly, Bramante, this guy over here, a friend of Raphael's and an uh, architect, and Raphael sneaked in to see the Sistine Chapel ceiling, saw it, and were just overwhelmed with how excellent it was. And stories have it, and we see this in some of the early studies of the School of Athens, that it's at that moment that Raphael determines that he needs to give Michelangelo a new, more prominent place in this painting, right in the foreground. So he changed his ideas along the way, paints him in there. But now you're left with an artistic problem, aren't you? Who do you put up here to balance him out? And we've already seen that Raphael likes to, you know, he's very socially graceful. He's over here with his friend Sodoma, just hanging out being, uh, you know, nondescript. I'm just kind of in the scene, but I don't want to make a big deal out of how great I am. So how do you, how do you deal with that? And the way they seem to have de dealt with it is to put this figure in here a little bit back so as to not buy for our attention here, but still somewhat balance it out. He looks awkward as hell, but actually his axis of his body is directly along the orthogonal. It goes straight through his body here. And he is either Socrates, who will die by drinking hemlock, or more likely um, uh, the, the cynic uh, philosopher of his age, um, whose name is escaping me, but it'll come back to me in a minute here. So let's get up close on this. You don't need to remember this. Uh, but many of these figures are, oh, I'm sorry, Diogenes is his name, Diogenes. Many of these people are very, very recognizable. We know who they are. Uh, we know who, they, uh, who their portraits are. This is your central one-point perspective that meets right about here, right? All lines in the composition lead there. Here's a close-up of some of these figures, right? There's... Raphael off to the side, Bramante over here teaching geometry. He's the architect of the time. And then finally, this one thing. At this time, Raphael is the director of all archaeological and architectural programs in Rome. So he's got a big job here. And he was tasked with coming up with the first designs for the renovation of St. Pe uh, Peter's Cathedral. St. Peter's as it looks today. He didn't go on to do this. He died too young to do that. And it was turned over to Michelangelo and others after him. But at the time, people believed that the anachronism of this architectural space, which after all, if we're in Athens, what's wrong with this architecture? It's Roman, right? Uh, it's got the Roman arch in there. The Greeks didn't know anything about the Roman arch yet. But there's an explanation for that. This may be Raphael imagining what the new St. Peter's would look like, which would have absolutely used the Roman arch and included that architecture in this, again, mythical scene of the bringing together of all these great thinkers of the time. Make sure you write down all these types of specific things in your notes. You won't remember them going forward, and they're absolutely things that when you get to an exam and you're like, well, I didn't bring that up and I didn't bring that up and I didn't bring that up, I forgot to put those in my notes, will be detracted from your essays. Those are the types of specific details that should be in your essays. And then facing this across the way is a work that we're not getting into in any detail. It's called the Disputa. And it's the, it's, again, it brings together various theologians, so religious thinkers through the ages, people like Augustine and various popes and so forth. And what they're doing is they're locked in a debate about the true nature of the Eucharist. And the Eucharist is the body of Christ, which is housed in this thing here, that little wafer or the bread that you see in the Last Supper. And they're saying, what is this exactly? How did this exactly occur? When we're in mass, the question was, is this little wafer actually really the body of Christ? Is it transubstantiated is what they would say. 
And this has been, again, most of us are like, who cares, right? So, but theologically, this is a debate that had raged for years. What is the nature of this? And it will be a debate, by the way, that continues with the Protestants and the Catholics in short order here. So they're in this debate, again, through time, and then up above, sitting above this, in perfect order, again, very Neoplatonic, isn't it? Perfect order up above, that's heaven, that's Plato's realm of forms. Are the elect, Jesus in the center, Virgin Mary on one side, John the Baptist on the other side, God the Father above, the Holy Spirit in his hand here, or I'm sorry, Holy Spirit here. What is the nature of all of this? Well, up here, everything's perfect, everything's ordered down here. In our material realm, everything's a little chaotic. We don't know, but we presume that God would know the answer to these questions. Does anyone have any questions on Raphael? Okay, so let's move on to Michelangelo. You had a reading on Michelangelo, and if you're wondering what to do with these readings, remember, um, you've got reading guides for them. You should be able to answer all of those questions. Those are the types of questions that I want to see implicit in all of your essays for midterms, finals, in your summary essays, and so forth. So we're on lecture guide number two. Michelangelo Buonarotti. No, you don't need to know the last names here. Whatever name I'm using in class, that's the one that you need to know to identify these artists. Michelangelo was apprenticed to a, uh, primarily a painter when he was young, Ghirlandaio, and then he went on to actually be almost adopted into the family of Lorenzo de' Medici. Yep. They're all in your lecture guide. So look at your lecture guide, Ghirlandaio. So he's adopted into the family of Lorenzo de' Medici. He lives with them from the time that he's 13 years old until he's at least 18, 19, although he's kind of off on his own as well. He studies their classical sculptures and he learns a little fit, bit from uh, the sculptor in the household, uh, Bertolde di Giovanni, but he this other sculpture was a bronze cast sculpture, and as most of you know, Michelangelo worked almost exclusively in marble, so he couldn't have learned a ton from him. He seems to have taught himself quite a bit just by studying the old classical works of art that he would find uh, in this, this family's household. The Medici family is the powerful middle class family from Florence, right? They're the ones that you've probably heard this name before. They go all the way back to the end of the 1300s, beginning of the 1400s with Cosmo the Great, uh, who was, a, again, one of these middle class families who attained a massive amount of wealth, loved classical uh, ideas and collected the heck out of classical arts, collected the heck out of classical philosophy, uh, and will patronize the arts uh, and expect their artists to create very classical works of art. One of the things that's really important about this story is that early on in Michelangelo's career, when he's in the household of Lorenzo de' Medici, that's the center of what was known as the Platonic Academy, or the Neoplatonic Academy is what I'd prefer to call it, run by a man by the name of Marsilio Ficino, who was the most prominent Neoplatonic philosopher of his age. In other words, the Medici family gathered around them all of these philosophers interested both in Christianity and classical philosophy, and Michelangelo would have had first-hand knowledge of this, probably sat in on their debates. He would have known Neoplatonism inside and out. It's a huge part of his own thinking. Again, on the, the handout for today, if you look at this quote at the bottom, it says, the greatest artist has no conception which a single block of marble does not potentially contain within its mass, but only a hand obedient to the mind can penetrate to this image. Think about that for a minute. This is the St. Peter's Pieta. It was originally one big block of marble. That's it. And what Michelangelo is saying is that God put perfection in that marble. He looks at that marble and Again, if his hand is obedient to his mind, and his mind, by extension, he's thinking is being inspired by God, he can see that perfect image in the block of stone. And then his job is just to clear away that appearance, that thing that gets in the way of our ability to see God's perfection in the world, so that we can all see it as well. It's very, very Neoplatonic thinking. 
As your reading goes on though, that reading by Sir Anthony Blunt, which is really heavy on the context, I think it's really important reading, you'll know that Michelangelo lives through some pretty difficult times and his artistic style will move away from strict classicism to something else. But we're gonna start with the classical stuff. Michelangelo did this kind of subject a number of times. The Pietà was a subject that was primarily popular in the northern areas, not so popular in, uh, in Italy at this time, but he makes it very popular. Pietà literally means pity, right? So suffering, it's a lamentation scene, primarily with the Virgin Mary and the Christ child, but oftentimes with a couple of other characters that might be at the crucifixion as well. In this, we just have the Virgin Mary, and we have the Christ here. So it's about sorrow and so forth, but Pietà also references the idea of piety, right? In particular, filial piety. Piety to one's father. Piety to God the Father. In, order, in other words, your devotion to both the family and the family in the sense of God the Father. Sometimes I don't even like to talk about this. I just want you to look at this for a minute. It's basically life-size. Virgin Mary is slightly larger in life-size. And I want you to just think of this for a minute. This was a block of stone. Someone made it look like this. Can you even imagine? Is that my phone? That is, sorry. I guess you get to hear my ringtone. Now I can't gripe at any of you if your phones go off. Turn off. Sorry. How do you do that? Right? How do you do that? Here's the thing, too. He finished this before he was 25 years old. Everyone feeling a little bit behind the curve about now? <laughs> so we've got a scene that's about death. It's about the death of uh, a man who's considered to be God on earth. Big thing for people who are Christian. And yet, does it really look you know, horrible? Does this look like a body that was beaten, tortured, hung on a cross for days? No, why? That's a, that, what's that? Because Jesus is perfect. Because Jesus is perfect. Because we've got an aesthetic philosophy here that wouldn't allow you to represent this naturalistically, would you? You don't want to show him as a real human being because the idea is that beauty, truth, and goodness all go together. That if I want to represent Jesus, who is good and true, he needs to be ideally beautiful. That's your starting point for everything. That's your aesthetic philosophy. That's your rationale for why beauty matters. If the artist is trying to show you God, and they believe that beauty, meaning ideal perfection, is what will show you God, then they need to make these works ideal in every way, even if it's about a man who was beaten and tortured and hung on a cross, you know, brutally, died brutally. You don't show that. There's other ideals in here too, right? Jesus was 34-ish years old when he died. The Virgin Mary was 14 years old when she was uh, incarnated with Christ. Therefore, she's at least 48. How many people think she's looking really good for 48? And why? Same answer. She's good, she's true, she needs to be beautiful. The platonic triangle is absolutely in play. And historically, for, for better or for worse, and I think it's for worse, people tend to associate beauty just with youth, particularly with women. So she's got to look young, she's got to have flawless skin, perfect symmetry, everything in the right place, and so forth. But now we get into a, a tricky territory here. The composition here is clearly a pyramidal composition, right? It looks like a big pyramidal composition, big triangle holding this all together. Very, very stable. And within that stable, a little bit of stability, a little bit of movement in here. The body laid across this and so forth. And by the way, keep your eye on that body. It's going to be quoted by artists coming forward over and over and over again. 
But my question to you is, is the proportionality of Jesus good? Yeah, probably get a canon of proportions out of him, although Michelangelo did not use canons of proportions. He tended to draw upon his own intuitive experience of form. But how about the Virgin Mary? If she stands up, how big is she? Big, enormous. She's gigantic. And why? Because it would look completely awkward if you had a regular sized dainty woman holding in her lap a giant man. And so he, he Michelangelo does this all the time. He says, oh, yeah, I know what the ideals are, but here's a place where I have to change that perfect proportionality and so the overall composition works. It's about unity. It's about creating a composition that works and he needs to sacrifice the perfect proportionality of the Virgin Mary's body in any case. Right? So all about beauty, all about perfection. You see this, and again, it's about a religious subject, but the idea is that the form itself is a manifestation of God's divinity, by which I mean perfection in form then is like the closest thing you can get to God. And I can't emphasize that enough. Yes, the subject matter is very Christian, but beyond that, it's like if God were to show you his perfection in the world, this is the closest thing you get to it. Right? Never is beauty or death look so beautiful. And so always, when you're thinking about this thing, what you're thinking is something like, here we have a representation of uh, the death of Christ that is made to look as ideal and beautiful as possible in order to communicate this, right? Whatever this is, the idea that God's perfection exists in the universe, that we're made in God's image, that's your thesis. And then you prove that thesis by going through and saying, here's one way it's made ideal. Here's another way it's made ideal. Here's another thing that an artist draws upon to create perfection. Everyone knows about this one, right? So the backstory to this is, this is Michelangelo's David. And David, for those of you who don't know, is a major figure in the Old Testament. He becomes King David, one of the first major kings of the Israelites. But early in his life, he gets famous when he uh, kills a much bigger, stronger warrior by the name of Goliath. And you don't need to know the ins and outs of this, but the Israelites are faced with you know, this powerful force. Their major warrior is this older Goliath. He's huge, he's a monster, right? And David's this young man. He decides he'll take him on because he feels like he's been inspired by God. He doesn't even have armor that fits him, so he uh, can't put that on. He uses a sling. The things that you've seen before are leather around a rope, swings it around, throws his rock, hits Goliath in the head, knocks him to the ground, runs up and cuts his head off. The story is a parable about the triumph of right over might, or the triumph of the Christian. Again, he's Jewish, actually, but these people think of the Old Testament as part of the Christian cycle <coughs> over the Philistine Goliath, over pagans over people who are powerful. Now, David happens to be the patron saint of the city of Florence. And this work comes from a commission by the city of Florence during a time that the powerful Medici family was actually banished from Florence. And the, the city council had taken over for a while. No, they're not a very democratic organization, by the way. They're basically made up of old aristocrats. But Nonetheless, they get the Medici out of Florence for a while, and you can read about the context of this in your readings. And while they're gone, there's this work, there's this, this piece of marble, huge piece of marble that had been sitting out of the Florence Cathedral for, I don't know, years. An artist had started to carve it and then had abandoned the project because the marble was understood to be flawed. It had a crack in it. But they thought this could be worked around, so they held a, uh, a competition for people to submit models, which is the way that big sculptural commissions ever occurred, in order to carve this into a sculpture of David. And the young Michelangelo wins this commission, and he sets to work with this supposedly flawed piece of marble. And he, of course, famously knocks it out of the park. Originally, when the sculpture was created, it was supposed to be on the Duomo, on Florence Cathedral, in a niche. 
right? Up high, second floor. So way up there. But you'll read in your readings from the Janssen that it was so incredible that no one wanted it hidden up there. They wanted it right out in front of the Galleria. And then it goes inside the Galleria here because uh, weather. So let's get up close on this. Simple question to you out here. How many people are like, that is a good looking dude? Go ahead, raise your hands. Even the guys are going to be like, yeah, okay, he's a good looking guy, right? Now, how are we supposed to think about this person? What are we supposed to think about this beauty? How are we supposed to make sense of it? What is it all about? Well, it's about something really simple. David does something he's not supposed to be able to do. He kills a huge, much more powerful, much more seasoned, experienced warrior. How does he do it? He does it because he's chosen by God, because he's like God. And how can I tell you that he's like God any quicker than to say that body is God-like? It's perfect. We're made in God's image. Therefore, if I create the perfect human being, specifically the perfect male human being, he's God-like. It's really straightforward, simple rationale. That is Neoplatonism. That beauty... While it might appeal to us on a sensual level, you might look at this and be like, damn, I wish my boyfriend looked like that, right? That's okay. For these people at the time, they probably thought that too. But the explanation for this would have been really rational. It's more like, wow, God, right? Not like, wow, where can I meet him later for coffee or whatever. Yeah? Pretty, pretty straightforward there. So now some extra information about this. You look at this figure, and in classical sculptures, when they do this, that's, that's called contrapposto, right? That's that characteristic weight shift that sets up a series of rhythms in the body in which one leg will be uh, what we call engaged, the other will be free. Same thing happens through the torso, the shoulders all the way through, and it looks very natural. It's not natural, of course, in this case, it's very ideal. It's a perfect body here. Everything's symmetrical, everything's very proportionate to some degree. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. And then, of course, this is a body that, while it's posed to go supposedly into action to do something, looks like it's going to sit here for all time. They're very static, meaning non-movement oriented, compared to Baroque works of art that you'll see coming up that are always in movement, always dramatic, always theatrical, and so forth. In fact, the only thing that you see in this body that doesn't look relaxed is his face. He's just starting to furrow his brows as if he's turned his head, registered that Goliath is over there, and then he's going to go get him. These works of art are set up to be oriented towards you frontally. This is your perfect viewpoint. Classical works of art have a particular perfect viewpoint, this one. Yes, you can walk around them. They are sculptures in the round, but this is the way you're supposed to see them. And I bring this up because when we get to the Baroque period, Baroque works of art are meant to be walked around, seen from multiple different standpoints, and so forth. So again, the face, the head, rational thought being pushed here, no strong emotions in this, even though, I mean, I'd be scared shitless, right? Going up against Goliath, nope, doesn't worry about it at all. It's all just thought. Then we go back to this. Look at the, the proportions, though. The proportions, according to classical standards, are off. He's too tall, right? There's too many heads to this body. His hands and his feet are a little bit big. He even kind of tips forward a little bit in an odd way that most sculptures would tip back a little bit more. And so people have wondered about what are we to make of this, right? What are we to make of these changes that, that Michelangelo made to the classical proportional system? One explanation, and you should always know the multiple different explanations of these things. One is, after all, David was a young man, and if you've seen adolescent boys, right, they look a little gangly. The hands and their feet grow first, and then they kind of grow into their body. Maybe he's getting at that. Another one is, well, the sculpture was, the marble was flawed in the first place, so he had to make it more slender than he would otherwise want to avoid this crack in the marble. Maybe that's it. The other one, the one that I think is absolutely most compelling, and it may be a combination of all of these, is think about where you would have originally intended, were originally intended to see this from. Down below, looking up. And when you look at something that's way above you, what happens to it? It foreshortens. It looks like it's not as tall. 
And so what if, imagine, what if Michelangelo says, well, it's going to be two stories up. I'm going to make it longer than it would otherwise look so that when you see it, it will rectify and look exactly proportionate as it should. And I don't want to lose any of the detail of things like the hand, so I'm going to make these a little bit bigger. And I don't want to be hidden in a niche, so I'm going to make it sit a little bit more forward than it would otherwise sit so that people can see this. What if that's his explanation? And there are precedents for this in Greek sculptures and in particular architecture. Some of you know this, if you've taken the 201 class, Greek architecture like the Pantheon, or I'm sorry, Parthenon is set up with what are known as refinements. And one of the most famous ones is if you stand at one end of the base, the stylobate of the Parthenon, and your friend stands at the other side, you'll only see them from just about the knees up because that's, that base actually curves up in the middle. And the reason it curves up is it's like almost 100 yards long, and an eye, when it sees a straight line, will perceive it as sagging. And the Greeks knew that, so they just said, well, we're not going to let the eye see it as sagging. We'll make it rise, so when the eye sees it, it will look level. Michelangelo is thinking of all those things before he creates this. And then again, remember, this was a big block of stone. He made a big block of stone look like this. And you don't get a second pass, right? If you screw up, you don't get to go back and like, oh, let's just add a little. No, it's start over, right? These types of things where you see little cracks, somewhere along the line, work's been broken. This stage hasn't been cleaned. So you see some water damage on this. It has been recently cleaned about five years ago. They spent forever on this, by the way. They did a million studies about what the best thing would be to clean this. Uh, and then you know what they came down to? Distilled water <laughs> and Q-tips. And one of those little cherry picker machines that like moves up around it that could only move one inch every 10 minutes. <laughs> so they wouldn't, but like some dipshit would go like, <laughs> You know, knock it over. It's like, okay, move it up. <laughs> Nothing. And then a picture for the ladies. No, this is, uh, you, can, you can see this from all angles, of course, but this isn't, this was never thought to be the angle that you would see this from. So it's right, but it's not totally right. Sistine Chapel, uh, of course, one of the major, you know, icons of Western art, and rightly so. <laughs> Sistine Chapel is a relatively small chapel as far as chapels go, primarily devoted to the clergy in the Vatican to go to, so not a big public space except on special days during this time period, uh, at least until he created this, this painting. Sistine Chapel itself had frescoes all along the walls, which are in various states of disrepair in this one. This, which is the altar wall, is something that Michelangelo painted later in time, and we'll come back to that later probably uh, in the next lecture. That's the Last Judgment. What we're talking about here is the painting of the Sistine Chapel ceiling, which happens in that first stage of Michelangelo's career where he's very much devoted to neoclassical thinking. It's a commission that Michelangelo didn't want. He was hard at work on a sculptural commission for Pope Julius II, uh, creating a memorial tomb to him that, by the way, would have taken his entire lifetime and a couple of more. It was like 50 large-scale sculptures both bronze and marble. He wanted to devote himself to this, but his pope pulled him away from this and sent him to work on this, probably, frankly, to save money. He, he, the painting is a lot cheaper than sculpture, and he wanted to set Michelangelo to work on something that would cost him less than that memorial uh, sculpture itself. Again, didn't want to do this, and then when he does it, he knocks it out of the park. If you're lying on your back looking up at the Sistine Chapel ceiling, it looks a little bit like this. These are all scenes from the book of Genesis, and they start, this is the first book of the, uh, the Bible, the Old Testament, of course, and it's uh, all about the creation of the world. Separate, it starts with the separation of light and darkness by God and goes on right about in the center to the creation of man and the creation of woman, and then moves on to the drunkenness of Noah at the other end. So getting up here a little bit closer, the scenes alternate down the center between smaller and larger images. And then on the sides are a number of things uh, in these areas in between what are known as pendentives. These little triangular spaces are alternating Old Testament prophets and what are called sibyls. 
You know, Sibyl is just a fancy word for a non-Christian prophet or oracle. And they're in there to say, all of these people before Christianity even came around were telling you about the coming of Christ. They're in there. In the pendentives and in what are known as spandrels, the ones that are in the corner are supposed ancestors of Christ, somehow related to Christ's family line. Um, I'll just show you these. You're not going to be able to talk about all these in any kind of exam, but all of this, this entablature, which is an architectural term, all painted in grisaille and trompe l'oeil style with what are called caryatids, columns that are made in the shape of human beings, run all the way around this thing. At the top of all these spandrels are what are known as bucrania, symbols of Roman times and uh, sacrifice. They're bull skulls, in other words. And then also in this, around these scenes, and you'll see close-ups of these, are what are known as innudi, or youthful, beautiful, nude men. So if I put this up in an exam, and I said, hey, tell me about this. Even though we haven't talked about this scene, this is a creation of man yet, would you feel kind of comfortable? Like, I got the basics on this. I know Neoplatonic philosophy. I know, you know, the rise of the middle class and humanism begot Neoplatonic philosophy and ideals. I get this. I can explain this. How does the visual form basically reflect Neoplatonic philosophy? Turn to your nearest couple of neighbors and share your thoughts. How does the visual form of this work reflect Neoplatonic philosophy? So help me out, what's the big one? What's the one you can't miss? Like, that's why they, I mean, what is it? Let's go to this one, I'll give you a hint here. Why is it okay to show nudity at this time? Why can you show a nude male, bo male body in the middle of a Christian cathedral? How many people grew up Christian, right? And what in general is the approach of Christians about sex and nude bodies and so forth? Not a big, warm embrace, is it? Not so often. And I, and I don't mean to impugn anyone's religion. I'm not saying anything bad about it, but it's not like it's like, oh, let's learn about ourselves really early on. It's like some kind of hippie family that I grew up in, by the way. So when you see this nude body like dangling above you on a Christian you know, chapel, what are you thinking? Something big's going on to make that okay. And what is it? What's the explanation? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so it's the creation of Adam, the first man by God. Right? That's what it is. First person created. And he's created specifically, and you see it here, don't you, in God's image. He's like God. And who could be more like God than Adam? God created him, created him in his image. Just stands to reason that if you see the perfect created man... He must be an, uh, a point of entry to understanding God, right? I know, I hate to belabor this, but I hope everyone gets this. That's the big idea. Those are the same bodies. I mean, one's clothed, one's not. One is passive. Look at this concave body. Passive, you know, inactive wrist up here. Looks like he's just waking up. And one's very active convex, moving forward, strong arm out, determined look on his face. But that's the only difference. The bodies are the same. 
Why is nudity okay? Because it's a reflection of the divine. And those of you who don't know, and I'll bring this up in a minute, when Adam and Eve were first created, there wasn't such a thing as uh, kind of shameful nudity because it wasn't sexual, or it wasn't erotic, rather. And so to be nude was no big deal. It's a little bit like, or it used to be like, I think things have gotten kind of weird these days, kids running around naked, right? Little infants. Babies up to like two or three years old. No one cares at all, right? They're just like, whatever, it's no big deal. Right? Isn't that, it's still a little bit true. Anyway, uh, it's a little bit like that. It's innocent. It's not sexual. It's rational. It's meant to appeal to the mind. This is beauty. That's God. And he's been idealized, right? Nice, nice spot. What else is ideal about this? How about, is it unified? Yeah, there's nothing extra in here. Nothing's really been created yet. Is there a clear focal point in this work? Where is it? It's a weird one, isn't it? Yeah, it's the hands. Both pointing, both looking, you're going to go there in that little gap between them. This is what separates the perfect human being from God. There is still a difference, but it's a close one. What makes man like God? Well, one of the things is our hand, of course. The thing that an artist used to create. The thing that separates us from the rest of the animal kingdom. That opposable thumb. Look at all the colors, the flesh tones in the, the entourage around God. Primarily analogous colors, right? A couple of bold colors in here, but mostly analogous. Is it balanced? Absolutely. Do we have a clear foreground? No real middle ground, but a clear foreground and background? Absolutely. There's no linear perspective in here because there's no architecture in here, so you can't get that in, but you get the idea, don't you? So let's talk about some of the details on that. Idealized body, right? Very symmetrical, very proportionate, muscular when it comes to men. Every once in a while, one of my students will be like, what's the deal with the penis? No one wants to say that out loud here, but isn't the case that it's supposed to be more idealized? Well, you saw David, right? I didn't belabor the point, but I don't know if anyone noticed that. There's a lot of manscaping going on with David. Did everyone notice that? It's like, oh, let's quaff that into a little you know, shape or whatever. In this case, penises are understood as vulgar, and I couldn't agree more, right? Vulgarity just means base, low. You don't want to emphasize it. You need to show he's man, but you're going to de-emphasize it here. Linearity. Remember Desenio? Look at the hard contour lines around these hands. If you're in a drawing class, they'd say, get rid of that. That doesn't look naturalistic. It's not supposed to look naturalistic. Supposed to appeal to the mind, and they believe that those strong <laughs> contour lines here appeal to the mind. That's why they're in there. How about this grouping? Who's in there with God? This is a tricky one. Who are all these figures? And if you don't know, a good way to test yourself is to be like, can you tell which gender they are? If you can't tell which gender they are, they either look like, uh, you know, by standard stand, you know, stereotypes, you think uh, it's kind of like a pretty looking boy or maybe a, I don't know, angels. So they don't need to have wings. They're a little bit more diminutive than other people and you tend to have kind of indiscriminate or, uh, you know, androgynous look when it comes to their sexuality. But there are a couple in here that are clearly not just angels. This one, a female, and this one here. And so again, if you think of that arm going out and following that arm through the shoulders here, they're emphasized, placed in front of the arm. Oops. Hand reaching out to touch this, and look at that hand, by the way. We're going to see that in a moment here. Who could those two be? Yep. Okay, definitely that's what you'd think immediately, right? He just made Adam, he's going to make Eve. It's all in this shape, by the way, that looks like what? This billowing cloud. What does that kind of remind you of? A brain, a brain maybe. Or part of the, uh, a heart, like a, if you cross-section a heart. Remember, these guys are all studying anatomy. They're looking for the first time at the human body. And either one would make sense, like God created out of his mental thought, God created out of what is the, the, you know, his love, his heart. And in this, 
you got these two things. So it could be Eve, and if that's Eve, then this would be Cain. I think Cain's the firstborn. Someone correct me if I'm wrong. It's either Cain or Abel. In any case, their child. Could be that, right? God's got this in mind. He's going to create them next. He knows what's going on. But there's another explanation for this. At the moment that God creates Adam, and he's going to put him in the Garden of Eden, he's going to set him loose, and he's going to say, be fruitful and multiply and do all these things, but don't do that. Don't eat out of that tree of knowledge. And they're going to blow it. If God knows all things, do you think God knew they were going to blow it? Yeah. He already had a plan. He already knew it. And if he already knew that they were going to blow it, what does he know has to happen down the line? What is he going to have to do in order to rectify the big mistake that Adam and Eve make in the Garden of Eden where they eat from the tree of knowledge and they force all of us to be born into the world with original sin? What is he going to have to do? And the answer is, he's going to have to have Jesus come to earth. He's going to have to sacrifice his son. And if that's the case, then who is this? The Virgin Mary, and that's the Christ child, already in his thinking. Perhaps, that's a possibility. Remember, think about this this way. The Virgin Mary, by the way, at this time, was the product of the Immaculate Conception. That term actually referred to the Virgin Mary, who was thought to have been born from God as well. And so now we've got kind of that genealogy in there. We've got this nod to the idea that God is all-knowing. And even when he first creates man, has a divine plan which is the way that Christians at this time would have thought of their God. Does anyone have any questions on that? So how about this? That's the creation of Eve. How is this different than the creation of Adam? You're doing a compare and contrast for your first essay based upon basically the same subject matter represented different ways. But how about this? We've got the creation of man and we've got the creation of woman. How are they different and what do those differences mean? Turn to your neighbors and just share a couple of your thoughts here and then we'll pick it up. So someone give me one difference and tell me how does it affect the way you think about the way that Michelangelo represents the different genders here. Remember, these are ways that, the easy way for you to see how societal views are reflected in art. You say, oh, that's the way they think about women, that's the way they think about men, and so forth. So what's one difference? Yeah. Okay, so God's not up there in heaven. He's not floating around with a posse. He's not uh, in kind of the divine realm so much. Kind of down here on earth, not just kind of floating around in the sky. Good. What else? Yep. Eve's body doesn't reflect God. Yeah, Eve's body doesn't look the same as God. It's certainly not a mirror image of God's image. And this leads us to a central problem, right? Um, in the Bible, absolutely, man and women are made in God's image, but how do you picture that? What does that really mean? If God's a father, if God's a man, how does a woman's body really look like a man's body? What do you do with that? And so you get this kind of weirdly masculine, a little bit lumpy, you know, uh, indeterminate body in there that absolutely doesn't look like God's body. What else? Does anyone think that this is an, uh, like the equal, almost symmetrical relationship we saw in Adam and uh, God? No, she's, our, she's coming up like, oh, you know, and they both, of course, would be beholden to God, but this looks 
really like she's under his thumb and it looks like she's already screwed up. If I didn't know which order this went to, he looks pissed off already. Like, oh God, I right? So you think of this and then you think, and you can keep going on with this, keep going on with this, but you think, well, why? And the answer is because it's a man's world we live in here. They're not thinking about women as equals to men. They're not thinking about women as being in God's image. And certainly in Michelangelo's case, he's thinking of the male body as that thing that most perfectly reflects God and a female body of like, uh, I don't even know what to do with this. Right? He's interested in this. These are one of those in nudo, which always strike me as being like one of those Calvin Klein ads, right? A very sensualized looking man. Um, sit, again, once you see this, you can't stop seeing it, can you? So I'll point it out to you, but like, uh-oh, what the hell is that all about? <laughs> those are stylized acorns. They actually are supposed to represent the family of Julius II, the Della Rivera family. It's part of their family crest. But if they look a little bit like weird greenish purple penises, um, they're, you know, it's about that. It's about progeny. It's about seed. It's about the family line and so forth. And again, it's impossible not to point this out, I'm sorry if you think I'm weird about this, but you do have to point out all the details. You can pose this figure any way you want. You can cover anything you want so that you get a little peekaboo of his junk here is on purpose, right? He wants to show you that. Why does he want to show you that? What is that all about? These are supposedly all about beauty, but I can't help but uh, side with a lot of younger scholars who say, you know, there's a lot of eroticism going in here, and it's almost assuredly pitched to men, not women, right? These are homoerotic uh, in some way. So how about this? We'll just end today with this one. This is the, uh, the scene of the Garden of Eden, and it's called the temptation and expulsion, in that it's what we call a simultaneous narrative, meaning you have two different moments in time represented in the same visual space, right? So you've got a before temptation, and you've got an act after they've been tempted, they ate from this tree of knowledge, they're kicked out. And I'm just going to give you the basic story, and then I want you to look at this and think, how is the artist telling the story? The basic story is this. And again, it's a really basic version. God makes Adam, he makes Eve, he sticks him in the Garden of Eden, which as far as I can tell is a little bit like Maui, right? It's beautiful, it's sunny, everything's great, there's want for nothing. He says, be fruitful and multiply. So even it's like, go do your thing. It's all good. You don't have to worry about anything. He just gives them one rule. Do not eat out of that tree over there. That's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat out of there. Then he leaves. They hang out for a while. A serpent shows up. Serpent starts talking to Eve and saying, hey, maybe you do want to eat out of that tree. Maybe God's just testing you to see if you have free will. Maybe there's something to be gained here. Temp, 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 temp. Eve eats out of the the tree and tempts Adam into eating out of the tree. Now historically, in the Bible, all this is about is a transgression against God. God said don't, they do, and what happens immediately? They recognize that they're naked, they're ashamed of this, and God finds out. However, historically in terms of Christianity, this almost always gets represented as a sexual fall. That term of temptation is a sexual temptation. Again, I'm not saying this is in the Bible. I'm saying this is the way it gets interpreted. That Eve tempts Adam with her sexuality. That Adam does something he's not supposed to do, which then leads you to think this. What are they doing when God says be fruitful and multiply when they're, what, that they're not supposed to be doing? What, what's going on here? Why is this a problem? Why is this such a big thing? But shot through with the way that this is interpreted, or, uh, interpreted are certain expectations and beliefs about the sexes that I want to talk about uh, quite a bit more when we come back uh, on, on next week on Monday. And I want you to really look at this, right? Look at this carefully. Realize that the artist has composed this exactly the way he wants to compose it, that we've got a before and what they look like and an after that our proverbial apple tree, it's not an apple tree, it's just a tree, is not an apple tree at all, and come prepared to start class on Monday just sharing some of these ideas.
Hi. I have a weird question. Um, in the textbook reading last night, it mentioned that Michelangelo got a lot of his marble from Kobe. 